want to just uh, share a little more about what I was talking about earlier in, uh, during worship and praise. You know, I heard somebody years and years ago say this, man of God say this. He says, one of the secrets to moving with God is finding out what God's doing and do it with him. See, God is not just sitting up on his throne, twiddling his thumbs, waiting for the last days to end. He's an active God. If you study the book of Revelation, you study the throne room in Scripture, you see that there's a lot of activity going on in the throne room. There are voicings, voices, there are lightnings, there are thunders, there's worship. It's all, God is, is continually moving forward in the spirit realm. Now, it's in the spirit that he's moving forward. And so many times, things are happening in the unseen realm. There may, you, you, know, you may be in a time where you just feel like you're just kind of stuck. Or, you're, you know, you're waiting for the next uh, God event to happen in your life. And in the spirit, things are happening quickly. You can't go by what's happening in the natural and interpret that as what's happening in the spirit. Amen? And so, uh, you know, this last uh, Wednesday when the Lord said that to me, when he, he got that over to me, you know, Jesus said, as he was preparing to leave the earth and he was giving his last words to his disciples that he knew these guys are going to have to, I'm handing the ball off to them. They're going to have to run with this thing and score a touchdown. Amen? He said to them, he said, the spirit of God, the spirit of truth, he will show you things to come. Yes. Now, why will the Holy Spirit show us things out ahead of us? Because he wants us to be ready to move with him in those things. See, one of the biggest problems with Je when Jesus came to the earth was the people, a lot of the people, particularly the religious leaders of the nation, were not ready to move with him when he got there. They were not allowing the Holy Spirit to show them things to come. See, even under the old covenant, if, you'll, if they would have studied the word and said, Father, interpret this to us, what does Isaiah 53 mean? Our elders and our, our, our teachers have taught us that the Messiah is going to come and there's, he's going to come in a, on a big you know, a white horse and he's going to be this conqueror and he's going to be in the spirit of David. He's going to destroy his enemies. So that's the Messiah they were looking for and that Messiah is coming. Yes, is. But the Messiah that showed up first or Jesus when he first showed up, he didn't show up as a lion, he showed up as a lamb. He came to be that sacrifice. He was meek and lowly. And it was even prophesied about him in Isaiah and other places that he wouldn't break a, a reed. A, he, you know, he, would, he wasn't going to come in like this big, da 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 da, here I am. <laughs> he was going to come in meek and lowly, but he, he was going to be powerful in his words and powerful in his deeds. Amen? Amen? So, in our lives, you know, the Bible tells us over in the book of Ephesians, which is the, the glorious church book, it's about how to walk in what Jesus walked in when he was here on the earth. In the glorious church book, it tells us you need to redeem the time. Yeah. Redeem, buy back, or uh, purchase it for the right purpose. And the word time there in that scripture over in Ephesians, that word is the word kairos in the Greek, Kairos doesn't mean, it's not chronos. Chronos means a succession of moments, uh, natural time. But kairos means that which you, sh you should do with the time you have. Exactly. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. See, all you have to do to miss the will of God for your life is ignore it. Right. Just ignore the Lord. That's all you have to do. Just go on. Because see, see, man, we saw this in the Garden of Eden, Man will always try to make God's kingdom and God in his image. That's what humanism is. Humanism has man as God. And so, you know, people worship their own head, their intellect. I know a, a minister who uh, died prematurely. He was dead for, I think he was dead for over an hour. And he, the Lord raised him up and brought him back. And he actually went to the gate of heaven and he saw people going to heaven and hell uh, in this experience he had. 
And he said, what I saw with the people that were going toward hell was whatever, they, whatever idol they worshipped on earth, whatever was their God on earth, went to hell with them. And he said, the Lord told me that the worst part about hell is that that thing that you, you, uh, you lusted after or you worshipped, it's unfulfilling and you won't be able to ever be fulfilled in hell. People are always talking about the fire and the torment of hell and that's bad, but it's the fact that you'll never be able to be fulfilled. And one of the things he said, he said some of the people that were headed for hell had huge heads. He said, because that's what they worship, their own head, their own intellect. Amen. Thank God for our intellect. Thank God for our soul. Thank God for our mind, will, and emotions. Thank God for all that. But that has to be subject to the Holy Spirit in us. Amen. They that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons, and that word sons in the Greek means mature, are the mature sons of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. So the Lord wants us to understand that we don't just get saved and, oh, I'm, I'm in, you know, I've got fire assurance now in my life. Hallelujah. I'm going to heaven. That's entry level. That's where you start. But you need to understand that God wants you, just like in the natural realm, there's a growing, a maturing that takes place. And you need to develop a relationship with him. I call it this, I say a walking, talking, living, loving relationship. See, religion, dead religion, always tends to eliminate relationship. It gives you a set of principles to live by. And a lot of Christians, that's, that's where they're at. And some of them don't know any better because they haven't been taught any different. I'm not throwing rocks at anybody. I'm just trying to, to help you see something here. That a lot of Christians, they, they look at the Bible and they say, well, here's the rule book. This is my rule book. This is my, you know, owner's manual for life. And that's true, it is. But this book, even though it's paper and ink and all of that, cardboard in this case, it's a a book that came out of the mouth of God. Peter said that the scripture, it says, holy men, prophets, holy men of old, were moved upon by the Holy Spirit. And they, the Holy Spirit released words into this earth, and we have those words and those stories and those things recorded purposely here so that we can see their experience with God and we can enter into a similar relationship and experience with God. It's about knowing Him, walking with Him, hearing His voice. Jesus said, my, voice, my sheep know my voice. Are you one of His sheep? See, a sheep follows. A sheep is looking for the shepherd, listening for the shepherd. Every day, understanding the shepherd wants to say something to you to lead you forward into that green pasture and that still water. He wants you to hear him. He wants you to develop a relationship with him. You say, well, I, I don't know what's God and what's not God. How do, how do I find that out? Well, uh, you know, when I first met Karen, I'd never heard her voice before. But I stayed on a pathway to where I learned her voice. I pursued her. I made a point to get to know her. I talked to her. I called her on the phone. Come on. Sure, somebody you know well, known for years, calls you on the phone, you don't go, who is this? You know who it is. Why? Because you've, been, you've pursued a relationship with that person. And God's the same way. See, Jesus said... He said, sanctify us. Now, don't get thrown, away, thrown off by the word sanctification or sanctify. Sanctify just simply means set us apart for the right purpose and the right ways and your ways, God. The ways that are going to work for us forever. The way you see it, the way you do it, the way you are. He said, sanctify them through your word, Father, because your word is truth. So when we read the Bible, not like a newspaper or a history book, 
But we read the Bible understanding that the Holy Spirit is the author, therefore he's the interpreter, and that there's this, this conversation that should go on through your spirit into your mind because we've been given the mind of Christ. We've been given a mind that can be anointed and empowered to think the thoughts of God. As we have this interaction with him on a daily basis, then he begins to show us, we begin to recognize him. We begin to understand his ways. We begin to, you know, you know if, if you knew somebody real well and, and they were a real good person and they'd never told you a lie in their life and you've known them for 40 years and somebody walks in and says, you know, that person's nothing but a liar. You'd say, wait a minute. Right. I don't believe that. Right. Why? Because I know them. Yeah. You know, maybe this person's trying to, you know, hurt their reputation or something for some reason. So it's coming into that place of knowing him. Amen. 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 And as you do that, what will happen in you is all of a sudden you will begin to mature spiritually. You know, that's what a parent does. A parent comforts and exhorts. And if you only do one side or the other, you're going to mess your child up. Some people don't discipline, oh, I just want them to know I love them, so I just comfort them all the time. Well, you're teaching them that they can just live however they want to, and nobody should ever straighten them out or tell them the truth or correct them. Right. And that does not work. Right. But on the other side, if all you ever do is, you know, correct them and, you know, tell them when they do something bad, something, something like that, and not encourage them right. to believe that they can come into what God has for them and that God loves them as much as he loves anybody on the face of the earth then you're going to mess them up the other direction. Right. Hallelujah. Are you here? So God wants us to understand that we have to come to that place of t walking and talking and listening, with him, listening to him because as the days go by, the Bible says over there in Ephesians, redeem the time, redeem the kairos. I put you on the earth for a reason and a purpose. And there are things I'm going to be moving in, and I want you to move with me. And if you'll move with me in these things, then my will will be done on earth. Yes. Because he has to work through us on the earth. And so as we, we make it a, a point to live that way, then he'll come and reveal to you things that he's doing or going to do, or you know, he'll begin to explain to you what season it is in your life and where you're moving and what's going on. But see, if you don't do that, then what you're going to do is you're going to be stuck in a religious rut. You're going to be running in a religious circle. In other words, your ideas about God and the way things are, and if you don't have this revelation that he needs to give you, to help you go forward and see where he's going and move with him by faith. Because see, if there's always going to be an element of faith to get anywhere with God. You're going to have to believe, number one, you can hear him. Because he said you could. You know, there's, there's different voices. There's the, your thoughts. There's the devil's lies that come against your mind. There's God's voice. There's these different voices. But as you pursue him, you'll begin to differentiate between them. Amen? Number one, God will never disagree with his word. Whatever he speaks to you will always harmonize with his word. Amen? So it's a learning experience. It's not something we all just do perfect. I'm not perfect at it right now. I told you I was sitting over there and he had to keep saying to me, seven days of praise, seven days of praise, for I finally picked up that he was saying something to me. Amen? But he wants us as the church to move with him in this day to accomplish something, to accomplish his will. Amen? So we need to come into that place of hearing him. And so right now, what he's saying to us, or he's what he said to me, and I'm just sharing this with you, you judge it with your own heart uh, and see what the Lord says to you about it, is that I want you to praise me for the next seven days. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm Mr. Curiosity. I want to know why. Now, sometimes God won't tell you why, because there's something, some things that are just none of your business. Amen? But there are things he will tell you. He'll explain himself. You have not because you ask not. I remember years ago, I was wondering about a scripture for years. Finally, one day I said, God, what does that mean? And he explained it to me. And I go, why didn't you tell me that before? He said, you never asked me. You have not because you ask not. 
So I asked him about this after Wednesday night service. I asked him about why are we, you wanting us to praise for seven days. Well, turn with me over to John chapter 4, the Gospel of John chapter 4. This is Jesus at the well, at Jacob's well. The Holy Spirit had led him to go through this little village of Sychar in Samaria. And you know the story. The woman at the well has been preached on a gazillion times. You probably know this, this story very well. But he began to have a discourse with this woman. She began to hear his shepherd's voice. He began to talk to her about some things. Of course, he was here in, the, in his body, so it's a lot easier to receive his voice when that's the case, right? But look what he said to her in verse 14. He, he had said to her before this that he asked her for a drink of water from the well. And then he said to her, I've got water to offer you. And if you drink the water I give you, you'll never need a drink again. It's everlasting water. Look at verse 13. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up. Everybody say springing up. Springing up. Into everlasting life. Now a springing up well is an artesian well. It's a well that you tap into a, an underground river where there's a current. And it, it pushes that water up out of the well and out onto the land. It's a, usually a continually flowing well. And so Jesus was telling her in language that she could understand, what I'm going to do in your spirit if you receive the water of life, or if you, if you get born again, if you become a child of God, if you receive me, basically, is what he's saying, is there's going to be a water of life, a spiritual water. Amen that's going to begin to rise and flow up in you, and it's going to spring up for eternity. It's going to keep you alive with everlasting life. So he's likening everlasting life, being born again, to a well of water springing up from a well, from a, a place in your spirit, in the depth of your spirit, springing up in your life, nourishing, watering, and blessing every part of your being, your spirit, soul, and body. Amen? So with that in mind, look over here in uh, John, we're in the same book here, John chapter 7, verse 37. Well, before we read the scripture, let me just say this. The Jews had their seven redemptive feasts, basically, and the last feast they had of, uh, before they, they launched off into this new year, even though it was actually already the new year, was the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles was done usually in, in September and October because the, the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar. We live by a solar calendar. And so the, different, uh, the days change every uh, year. And like I said, uh, Wednesday night at, at sundown, because the Jews' day begins at sundown, at sundown this, this feast uh, was a calendar. And for seven days they would spend time praising and worshiping God. They would live in sukkahs, or these, uh, actually it's, it's called today by the Jews the Feast of Sukkot. A sukkah is a temporary, kind of thrown together, lean-to type of a building that they would make. And they would live in this thing for seven days while they were celebrating the Lord and praising Him because it was to remind them that when their relatives, when their ancestors were in the wilderness for 40 years, they had no provision naturally, but God took care of them. He was their source. It was a time of stopping and focusing, refocusing yourself and thanking him that he had been your source of life in every area all that year and that the blood of atonement that had happened five days before uh, had been offered and God had covered their sins for another year. Of course, we know that Jesus is our atonement and so forth. He's our high priest and his blood is on the heavenly holy of holies, crying continuously, mercy, mercy, mercy from the mercy seat on our behalf. But they would celebrate what God had done for them in their, you know, spiritually and also naturally. And it was also a time when the harvest had just been brought in. So it was a time of year where if a man and men do, we do have a tendency to start thinking that we're our own source and that we've accomplished something. 
It was a time where God put them back in a booth out in the desert. Here, go live in the shed for a while. And look up through the cracks in that ceiling and see the stars and remember, it's me that caused you to harvest. It's me that has prospered you. You study Israel's history, it was when they forgot God. When they started thinking they were doing it on their own or somehow they didn't need to, you know, honor him in some way. And, and that, of course, leads you into darkness and deception. You start putting, you start framing God in your own human peanut brain uh, theories. And it becomes wrong and the enemy gains access and deception and eventually leads you into a place where God has to pull back from you to keep from destroying you. And your enemies come in in the vacuum and overcome you. Those things have not changed. We have to keep God in the right spot. What does the Ten Commandments say? You shall have no other gods before you. What does that mean? Here you are, here's God. Don't put anybody or anything between you and God. Especially you. Because we've had 40 years of people teaching in our universities and teaching in our society. It's all about you. I got news for you. It's not all about you. Now with God it is all about you. He loves you more than you can understand. He's for you. He's been more graceful to us than we deserve. He's merciful. He's kind. He loves us. He loves being with us. When these singers get up here and sing, it's not about whether they're on key or they sing good or not or a favorite song or a, a ability to play. It's about the singer, not the song. He loves us. We're his children. But when we step into deception and start thinking that we get to be God... Isn't that what he told Adam and Eve, what the devil told Adam and Eve? Uh, you can, God, no, God's, uh, he's conning you. Hath God said, anytime you hear the devil say something about questioning what God said, you know right now you're being set up. Do you really think that scripture's true? Do you really think that? Absolutely it is. So God told Adam and Eve, you can do life without God. You don't need God. He's afraid that you're going to understand things he understands, and you'll be, and boy, here's the big lie, on his level. Thank you, Jesus. And so, you know, the Lord told me one time, he said the same lie that the devil told Eve in the garden and Adam in the garden is the same lie he's been telling all these thousands of years, and he's still telling it today. You can do life without God. And the more you do it, the deeper you get in, bad stuff. Amen? So God, you know, when he, when he brought them out of Egypt and he brought them into their nation, he, he did this, this circle of time. You know, time is linear in one way, but God sees time in a, in a cycle or a circle. Think of it being a hedge or a protective circle. He gave them those seven feasts, not so they'd just be religious and do something religious seven times a year. Each one of them, when they did it from their heart and they did it in the revelation of that, what, that which he gave it, then it became something that empowered them with God and kept them safe and kept them within the circle of that protection and blessing every year. Right. Amen. Amen? And so this Feast of Tabernacles, which is going on right now, was a time where they'd come to the end of that cycle. They were starting a new one and God told them just stop for seven days and focus on me and thank me and praise me for who I am. Refocus. David said in the Psalms, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Uh, I don't, they don't do it so much anymore probably. When I was a kid, we had these little magnifying glasses. We'd get little you know, things we'd get out of like Cracker Jacks or cereal box or something. Amen. Do they even still have Cracker Jacks? Okay. And, you know, you'd go out in the front yard, and you'd get a piece of paper, and you'd put it down there, and you'd, you know, get it just right to where it was putting a, a beam on that paper, and eventually it would get hot and burn. Some of you were real kind of mean, and you'd get bugs and do that to them, and stuff like that, or find your cat sleeping, and... I, I never did anything like that, but I know people that did. <laughs> Hallelujah. Y'all pray for me, amen. But, you know, 
there's there, this cycle that they lived in. There was this time where they came to where, and, and David was saying it, magnify the Lord with me. Because what you focus on is where you're going to go. What you focus on is, is what you're going to do and where you're going to go. That's why the enemy daily comes to us and tries to invade our thought life with bad stuff. And sometimes it's real stuff, things that have happened, but we have to determine, we got to be, you know, you got to be, be a spiritual warrior. You're in a war of words. You know, Joyce Meyer, one of her best messages, probably her, the message God put in her to really preach is battlefield of the mind. Whoever controls your mind and your thought life will control you. Yes, mind control is real. And either God is going to control your mind and your spirit and your being, or the enemy is going to. The Lord told me one day, he was correcting me. I was fooling myself. I was driving down Yosemite Avenue. He said, John, whatever part of you I don't, I'm not Lord over, the devil is. Don't fool yourself. Don't think you can play that little game of letting me have, well, you got three quarters of my life, God, but I'm not ready to surrender this yet. I'm going to do this over. No, you're not. The devil's going to come and deceive you, and he's going to run that area of your life, and it's going to be a break in the circle. The hedge is going to be broken, and the Bible says if a hedge is broken, a serpent will bite you. He's going to come in and grab a hold of you in some way. Are you trying to scare me today? Absolutely I am. Amen. The enemy is playing for keeps, folks. I've been pastoring over 30 years. I've watched too many Christians die because they wouldn't close that hedge. I've even had God prophetically show me. I've had him, I'm not going to go into all that, but I've, I mean, he, he's just made it plain as day. And people still, it's amazing how hard-headed we can be sometimes and hard-hearted. Humility is the only place to stay in. I've got to get this done here. So, Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus told that woman, there's a well in you that springs up continually when you get born again. So they would go to the Feast of Tabernacles. They would refocus on God. They would praise God. They would worship God. They would magnify him. And then the eighth day, look at verse 37 here in John chapter 7. The eighth day of the feast is called the great day of the feast. In the last day, that great day of the feast, it says, Jesus stood up and cried. Jesus interrupted the whole meeting. Now it was God, it wasn't he, just him. Saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. That's kind of like what he told that woman, huh? He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly, or out of your spirit, shall flow rivers of living water. Now he's not just talking about a well, he's talking about rivers. Kind of the same thing, artesian well. But what he's, he's saying here, now let's just finish verse 39. But this he spake of the spirit which he, they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. In other words, he hadn't gone to the cross, raised in his glorification in his body, went to heaven, put his blood on the, the mercy seat in heaven, became our great high priest, and then was empowered by the Father to pour out his spirit when he eventually went to, back to heaven for good, to pour out his spirit upon us. And 120 people on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came into that room. They heard the, the rushing wind of the glory of God. They saw the fire of God come. And then all of a sudden, out of their innermost being, there came a well of water of them speaking in languages. Uh, the, in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, Yes, though I speak with the tongues of men, the languages of men, or the languages of angels. You can speak in a heavenly language, or you can speak in, a, in a, an unknown tongue that you don't know, a language. Amen. Two weeks ago, a pastor friend of mine in Fresno, his Sunday morning service, one of his ladies four years ago married a man who was an Arabic man. And he never, would never come to church with her. Finally, he came two Sundays ago. They're sitting there, and they begin to praise and worship and magnify God and, and shout. And some people were praying in other tongues. And the man grabbed his wife's hand. They ran out of the building. That afternoon, uh, she called him and said, listen, she said, we got out of the building, got in the car, and he told me, you're never going back to that church again. She said, well, why? What's wrong? He said, they were speaking in Arabic, and I know they don't know Arabic. They were magnifying God. He said they were praising God in Arabic, and I know they don't know Arabic. 
So that was a supernatural sign to him, just like the Bible says tongues are to people. Uh, that kind of thing is. So what happened? The well came flowing out. The well came flowing out. Praise God. Now back in the Old Testament, over in Genesis chapter 26, I was going to read the scriptures, but I won't for sake of time. You can read it if you want when you get home. Genesis 26. Isaac, Abraham's son, the child of promise, was born. He grew up. His father passed on. His mother passed on. He was married. And there was a famine in the land. Just like there's been in our, our nation, there's been a spiritual famine in the land. And so he went down to Gerar. He went down there to, to survive. And while he was down there, certain things happened. And uh, he, you know, he became blessed down there. But the famine was still on. And when they got upset with him and basically forced him to leave, he knew where his father Abraham had dug all the wells when he was alive. And the Bible says that Abraham's enemies had plugged up the wells. They'd plugged them up. But Isaac, in this famine, he knew where the wells were at. And so he would go to one of these wells, have his servants dig it up, get water from it. And the Bible says that during that season of famine, when nobody else was getting a crop, he was reaping a hundredfold. <coughs> Hallelujah. See, it doesn't have to be mass blessing over the whole land for you to be blessed. You just got to know where the wells are at. And so then the Philistines and the enemies would come and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is our land too. And they'd run him off of that well. And he'd go to another one. He'd dig it. Same thing. And he just kept moving. Finally got over to the well of Oath, the seventh well. Uh, there, Sheba, he, he, he got there and he redug that well. He dug it up, and it was a well of springing water. And the Philistines finally figured out, you know, this guy, <laughs> every time we run him off, he ends up blessed. Maybe we better get an agreement with him. Yeah. So they came into agreement with him, and there was a reestablishment of his spiritual heritage that his father had done with the, the king of the Philistines before, there in Beersheba. He returned to that place of his heritage and that place of blessing. Praise God. But now, now listen, this is where I want you to see this in connection with what we're talking about. Isaac's name means laughter, joy. His mother had him when she was almost 100 years old. She had to find something to laugh about. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know, the greatest disgrace in their culture, Abraham and, and, and uh, Sarah, the greatest disgrace would have been for them to go childless. That's why, you know, God, God appears to Abraham, and Abraham's saying, what are you gonna, I'm, I'm childless, what are you going to do about that? That's why he made that such an issue. I don't know, I, that probably might not have been the first thing I thought of if God would appear to me. But it was important to him. And it was because he was to start a race of the seed of Abraham, which would culminate in Jesus, the seed of Abraham. Amen? Yeah. But Isaac, if you study his life, he really wasn't famous for a whole lot other than redigging his father's wells. Yeah. A lot of trash, a lot of Philistine garbage, probably, were put down in those wells, plugging them up, dirt, whatever. And as I was thinking about this and asking the Lord Wednesday about what had happened Wednesday, he, he, he had shared this uh, with me before, but he just reshared it with me again. He said, you know, your spiritual well can get plugged up. Your spirit man can get plugged up. The devil's always trying to plug your well. Why? He's afraid of the rivers of living water. He knows that when the Holy Ghost has a free flow out of your mouth and in your life toward other people in the healing power of God, that great, wonderful, miraculous kingdom of God things happen in your life. And people begin to see that you have been with Jesus. They begin to see there's something more than just dead religion, routine, a rut. A rut's nothing but a grave with no end to it. And that's where a lot of Christians are living. I don't blame them. They go to church and it's just a religious rut. Who wants to do that? Yeah. Amen? But you can go to a church that's not a religious rut and still be in a rut. Because whether you have that, that water flowing out of you, that vivacious, refreshing water, that water that goes out and blesses and refreshes other people and refreshes you, it's up to you, not your pastor and not the church you go to. Right. Yeah. You need to blow out your well. And that's what they would do every year. 
they would stop for seven days and they wouldn't think about uncle so-and-so and and how much money he stole from them or who the king was or wasn't or what was going on you know what the price of donkeys was on the stock market yesterday or whatever for seven days they would purposely focus on and praise God and God would blow out their well God would cause them to come into that place of freedom to where they were so focused on him that all they could see is God. You know, I had a friend of mine one time, Christian friend. He was going to tell me something. And he said, well, I know you don't like to hear anything negative. And when he said that, it kind of bothered me. Because he was going to tell me about a situation that was going on or a problem of some kind. And after he left, I got to thinking, I don't mind hearing negative things. I just always like to look at it from God's perspective. You know why? That's the real perspective. The eternal perspective. See, there's, there's temporal, temporal truth and there's eternal truth. You may have a sickness in your body. That's true. That's real. If you've got disease in your body or cancer in your body, or whatever, that is true. It's real. It's temporal, though. And temporal, one of the definitions of temporary means it's subject to change. Because eternal truth rules and reigns over temporal truth every time. And Jesus released an eternal truth that said, by his stripes we are healed. So we don't deny, we don't pretend things aren't true in the natural realm. We just refuse them the right to be the last word. Amen? If you go see your doctor and he gives you some bad news, that's wonderful. Get a second opinion. At least he's he's showing you where you're at and what you're up against. Go to God, go to the great physician, and ask him his opinion. And I can tell you what he's going to tell you. He's going to show you his word. Aren't you glad the little woman over there in, was it Mark 4, Mark 5? The little woman with the issue of blood. She had bled for 11 years. She had an issue of blood coming out of her body for 11 years. Under the law, she could have been stoned to death for being in public. And so, but she, she heard about Jesus. She heard some eternal truth about him, that he was a healer, <clears throat> and that the healing power of God was flowing through him. And she fought her way through a crowd to get to him. In her weakened condition, she fought her way. Now, the Bible says that Jesus was in a press. He was in a place where people were elbowing one another out of the way to try to grab him because they thought if they touched him, something good was going to happen. But nothing good ever happens unless you touch him by faith, unless you touch him to receive, unless you touch him to take hold of something. Amen? And so she elbowed her way through, and it says she grabbed the hem of his garment. She grabbed the the talit. She grabbed that that, uh, prayer shawl that he was wearing. She took hold of it, praise God, because she she probably had read the scripture in Malachi that said the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness is going to rise with healing in his beams or in his wings. And the wings of that talit, that prayer shawl he wore, that part down there that she grabbed was called the wing. She was believing the word and she grabbed hold of that because he's got healing in his wings and in his beams, hallelujah. The beaming glory of God coming out of him. And she was instantly healed. And Jesus said, you know, let me me say it this way. She picked Jesus' pocket for a healing. He didn't even know it. See, he didn't know everything all the time. He had to be anointed by the Holy Spirit and directed by the Holy Spirit. And so she touched him. He felt the power of God go out of him. All these people are pressing in on him. He turned to his disciples and says, who touched me? Turned to the crowd, who touched me? And the disciples are like, uh, Jesus, there's a whole lot of folks touching you right now. He meant, no, 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 who touched me by faith? Who took hold and received and pulled out of me what I had for them? And it says, finally, she, you know, she was kind of in intimidated by the whole thing. I mean, she knew she could be stoned to death and Jairus was standing there right next to him, to Jesus. He was the leader of the synagogue who could have given the order for her to be stoned to death. See, if you, if you let the devil, he will stop you from getting a hold of Jesus. There'll always be some reason you can't go or do or be. 
But you have to be dogmatic about, I'm never going to quit. I'm never going to give up. You've got to quit asking yourself whether you should do something or, or stop doing something. Start asking him. And if he tells you do it, then you do it whether you want to do it. You do it whether it's easy. If you have to crawl, don't call and make an excuse. When you get that way about your walk with God, you're getting ready to connect like that woman did. Hallelujah. Well, I didn't plan on preaching on her this morning, but good anyway. Amen. <laughs> Sam Swegg, a friend of ours that comes, has come here and minister. He said, you know, he ministers healing. He said he saw a man one day come in the building, and he said the guy was having to crawl on all fours to get in the building because he couldn't walk. He said, I knew that guy was going to get healed before he left. People make excuses. Can't go to church. It's raining. I might get my hair do wet. Give me a Holy Ghost break. Well, hallelujah. So what was Jesus saying here? See, the eighth day, let me, let me stop here in a minute. The eighth day, the great day of the feast, what they would do on that day is they would do what they call the water libation. The priests, the high priests would go down to the, the stream there. I forget the name of it all the time. Living water, moving water there in, in uh, Jerusalem. And they would have this big, I mean, this was a big, fancy celebration parade type thing. The people had these palm branches, and they had all these different fruits and things that uh, symbolized God's blessing and his goodness. And they would actually shake them like this, and it made the sound like rain was falling. Because you see, Israel has to have rain every year or they don't have a crop. Amen? And so they were, what they were doing there is they were, had praised God and now they were actually praying and believing him for another year of rains, the early and the latter rains to fall so that the crops would grow and they'd be blessed. Yeah. So the priests would get, in the, get this water in this, uh, this container, whatever it was, and he would march back up between the people as they were praising God and making it sound like rain. And he would go up and he would actually pour down this pipeline type thing onto the altar in the temple. Now the altar, what's that? That's the place where people would bring the sacrifice, a sin sacrifice, a praise offering, the different kinds of sacrifice. And they would put it on the altar. It would be consumed by fire. And it was an offering unto God from their heart of praise or, or repentance or whatever it was. Well, this priest would pour on that altar, basically saying, God is going to receive our sacrifices this year. He's going to receive our hearts and our prayers and our repentance and whatever it is. And he's going to respond by pouring out his blessing upon our land. Hallelujah. So that's the place they were at right there. They were doing the water libation. Now let me read it again. Verse 37, in that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth <coughs> on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And he was, he was, see, Jesus was going to transition them into the full understanding of Pentecost and the full understanding of what it meant to be spirit-filled. That it's not, this, this ceremony isn't just about God blessing your land with another year of rain. It's about you being that blessed one to where the waters flow up out of you. So he had just given them seven days to praise him to blow out their spirit to blow out their will, to come into a place where they're full of joy, they're full of praise. They're not griping and complaining anymore. They're focused on him. They're going into that new year with hope and with faith and praising and blessing God. And that's what the Lord said to me after I asked him about this on Wednesday. He said, if you will praise me for seven days, he said, you will, your, your spirit will be cleansed. Because see, the Holy Ghost can't be, uh, he can't be tainted or somehow marked with sin, but your spirit man can. We're told in Paul's writings that we're to cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit. Even though you're a born-again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, devil-chasing Christian, you can cop an attitude in your heart. You can start holding hatred or unforgiveness or bitterness against somebody. 
you can pollute your own spiritual waters. That's why David told Solomon in, in Proverbs 3, he said, listen to me. He said, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the flowings forth of your life. Whatever's in your heart's going to flow out into your life, and it'll be good or it'll be bad. See, a lot of religious theology teaches us that, well, just God's sovereign, so whatever happens, it happens. That's not true. God is sovereign, but when God says something, he lives by it for eternity. Come on, are you here? That's a whole other subject. We, need, we don't want to get into that. But the point is, is that what the Lord showed me, and here's what he said to me. I believe he said to me. He said, John, if you will praise me. And he didn't, it wasn't 24-7 for seven days. But to just take some time. I try to take about an hour. That's what works for me. And just sit there and praise and magnify me and thank me and bless me for who I am, what I've done. And so I've been doing that an hour a day since then. I'm not bragging on me. I'm just telling you. And he said this to me. He said, if you'll do it, he says, things inside you will change. Some things that need to change. Some things you may know about in you. Other things you might not even know about it. But see, we go from glory to glory. We, co we come more into the image of Jesus. And he was just telling me that things inside you would change. And he said, and even some things outside of you will change. Uh, come on. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise God. So I just wanted to share that with you this morning. I know we're like, what, halfway or three quarters of the way, or whatever, through the, the piece. Of, but I don't think that's what it's about. You just ask the Lord, Lord, you want me to get in on this? Lord, uh, you know, I'll, I'll praise you for seven days starting today if you want me to. Or if you just want me to praise you for a few days here. Or praise you until you witness in my spirit that I'm done. But see, we don't focus on him enough. It's too easy to start trying to figure out our problems on our own. It's too easy to fall into that trap. Amen? I remember one time, the Lord, my wife was struggling. Can I tell this story, honey? Praise God, I have her permission. Now you all are witnesses, amen? Every year around Christmas time, Karen would start getting depressed. And, you know, just that people call it the holiday blues, and I've heard it called stuff like that. And, and a lot of it had to do with it's just her past and memories from the past and, and just different things. You know, the enemy, will just, he'll just mess your thoughts up. He's messed mine up and yours too. And one day I was just praying for her. I could tell she was struggling. And one day I was praying for her, and the Lord said, go tell her that she's mad at me. I said, oh, no, no, no. no you go tell her she's mad at you. You tell her she's mad at you. And so I finally humbled myself, but I did it looking around the corner. And uh, I just shared that with her, and she looked at me, and I could tell she wasn't receiving it at the moment. But she did receive it, and God helped her. Why did I tell that story? I have no idea. That's it. That's why I told that scripture. See? The scripture he gave her, he gave her a scripture that says, in the Old Testament says, you praise the dead more than you praise the living. You can get caught up in dead things. You can get caught up in things that aren't going to produce life. That's why when God showed Ezekiel the dry bones, he, he asked him a question, can these bones live? How do you see this? And Ezekiel said, only you know, Lord. Hallelujah. That's why it's, it, any time the enemy brings something dead to your mind, you immediately go to the one that lives and you praise him. We're going to learn. We're going to learn. We're going to learn. God is bringing his glory back into our nation. I know he is. And this week is a key time for us. There's a witchcraft spirit that's been on this nation that actually started in the 50s that's brought people into deception and under a spell to where they believe things that aren't true. And God is breaking that off of this nation.
I don't have time to tell you how I know that, but I know he is. And we are going to need to step up into that freedom and into that focus of praising him and just make it a lifestyle. I am going to praise you, not for everything that happens in my life, because some things he doesn't want you to praise him for, but he wants you to praise him in everything for who he is. Amen? Praise God. Well, before we go t- today, we're going to receive communion together. And uh, let's just, as we receive this, let's just recommit our hearts to being focused on him. You know, it was the blood of the cross that made this available. Amen? I mean, you can start right here in this communion service, praising him, because it was the blood, the life of God that got out into this natural realm and began to change things. We have a good friend, a prophet, who uh, comes to our church, has come to our church since 1985. His name is Larry Huggins. He's going to be with us in January for uh, free services. And Larry preached a message when he was here, not the last time, but uh, not too far back. He preached a message about the DNA of God. He said that God's, he read the scripture, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. And when you look that word up in the Greek, begotten, it's genome. It's the gene of God, the DNA of God, the life, the building blocks of God, the life of God. When the Bible says that we have life in us, it's, you know, when the law of the, Romans 8, the law of the spirit of life, what's in your spirit? Life. Zoe, pure life, unadulterated life. The law of the spirit of life has made me free from the laws of sin and death. Jesus said we're a new, cre- new, new creation, a new species of being that's never existed before. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. You're an alien. They all have all these programs on TV about aliens. They don't know you're right in front of them. Heaven's your home. The kingdom's your home. Amen? Amen. And so as we receive communion, I know that that's grape juice. I know that these are just little crackers. But it symbolizes the breaking of God's body to release the DNA, life of God, into us. We have his nature now in us. We're not just saved from something. We're saved to something. We're born again. Amen? Glory to God. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. So as you receive today, understand that the power that's in that life, the power is to push away or extinguish anything that's not of God's kingdom. Receive his blood today. If I wish I had had the time recently, I haven't done it in a long time. I share a message called the seven times Jesus bled. If you study the scriptures, you find out that there were seven times blood came out of his body in his passion. And every time, seven in the Bible, if you study it, is the number of perfect completion. He did a perfect, complete work with his blood. And every time he bled, he paid the price for something. The first time was in the garden. It says that he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. He said to his disciples, and Jesus never lied and he never exaggerated. He said, I am so, my soul is so full of sorrow, I'm about to die. Now you and I have been depressed, but we've never been that depressed. What was happening? The sorrow, all the sorrow that could ever come on anyone on this earth came on his soul, his mind. And he had to pray for three hours. He had to stand and pray. He had to pray that prayer of committal. Father, if there's any way to not drink this cup, let it pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, your will. And after three hours, it says an angel of heaven came and strengthened him. And actually the word that's used there is the word combat in what he was doing in prayer. He was fighting against the pressure that was on him to run from the cross. And after three hours, he was strengthened. He stood up and he said, okay, I'm ready. Let's go. And in Hebrews 12, it says 
that he was able to go to the cross because he got into a place and he had joy in him seeing everyone that would be saved and that would come back into the kingdom and all of the glory that would be restored because of what he was getting ready to do. He went to the cross because he thought about you. And so his blood today received not just the the liquid in the cup, but receive from him that which you need in your, in your life, whether it's spirit, soul, body, you know, physically, spiritually, soulishly, financially, relationships. The blood will heal marriages if you'll apply it. Amen? The blood brings the glory, presence, and power of God. Demons scream and run from the blood of Jesus. It's full of life and light. It pains them to even be near it. So, Lord, we thank you this morning. You're so good to us, Lord. Thank you for showing us how to redeem the time. Thank you for drawing us into that place of praise. God, I believe there are people under the sound of my voice, whether it's in this room or over the internet today, that seven days from now, their life is going to be different. <clears throat> There's going to be joy bubbling up in them, Father. The enemy <laughs> and all that he's done to try to plug up their Holy Ghost well is going to be far on down the road, washed away by the life of God. But Lord, we know it all started at the cross. It all was made available. Jesus, you didn't have to allow your body to be broken. The, the, the hatred of man couldn't break your body by throwing you off a cliff. The enemy's diseases and maladies that you touched throughout your three and a half years of ministry, every kind of communicable disease on the face of the earth, I'm sure, couldn't break your body. But you gave your body to be broken. And in your brokenness, we have wholeness. We receive our wholeness. We choose to walk in love with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. We choose to walk in love with even our enemies. We choose to bless them and pray for them. We choose, Father, that if we break peace and fellowship, to, to go and to, to make peace and fellowship once again. We choose to live in that true spiritual unity with you and with your people. And we thank you that in your brokenness we are made whole. We receive your body today. You may go ahead and receive it together. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, go ahead. I felt the glory of God come on me super, super, super strong. Stronger than I've ever felt it come on me in a while. And it's on me right now really, really strong. And um, someone brought something to me right now to read, and I read it, but it confirmed what the Lord wanted me to do, and this was what he wanted me to do concerning this part when we, when we drink the blood. Oh. Man, thank you, God. The glory came on me strong, and I felt it come in this place when it came on me, and this is what he said. He said that people that are struggling in here with sickness, disease, demons, they need deliverance. I want them to stand up during this portion while we drink this blood. If you're struggling with sickness or disease in your body, I want you to stand. If you want to be healed, stand right where you're at. If you've been tormented in your mind and you feel like there's been habits, because a lot of us are in that place right now in our lives where God has been dealing with us. You notice I said us. Dealing with us about mind habits, maybe things that have just tormented us and just grinded and grinded and grinded on us for years. And it's intensified because we're coming to a place in our life where we're tired of it. And we've been seeking the glory of God. We've been seeking the face of God. And the devils are ticked off and mad because they're leaving us. They're loosing our minds. They're loosing family members. They're loosing 
areas in our lives that they've had control in in our lives over years. It seems like we just can't get rid of it. It just dogs us and dogs us and dogs us. Well, today they're going to be broken in the name of Jesus. So, Father, with that glory that's on me right now, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I proclaim and I declare over my life, my mind, my family, my friends, my sisters, my brothers in this place right now that have stood and are believing, I break the power of the devil over their lives in Jesus' name. And I say sickness and disease, loose their bodies now in Jesus' name. Come out of their blood, come out of their organs, come out of their cells, come out of their bones, come out of their brain, come out of their life now in Jesus' name. And you foul devil that's been tormenting my mind, my family, my brothers, my sisters, you loose now and go by the blood of Jesus Christ right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I plead the blood of Jesus over our lives right now. And I say by the blood of the Lamb, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I say by the blood of Jesus Christ right now that every demon has to leave and loose its hold now in our lives in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, take your hands off our families, take your hands off our neighbors, take your hands off our lives, take your hands off our kids, take your hands off our grandkids, take your hands off in Jesus' name. And I release the glory right now. I release the glory to heal. I release the glory to deliver. I release the glory to be uh, uh, released in our minds, our hearts, our lives right now in Jesus' name. And Lord, we seal these words right now. We seal your presence. We seal that anointing that's in this place right now. We seal the words that we have spoken out of our mouth right now by faith in the name of Jesus Christ. That we are healed, saved, delivered, set free in the name of Jesus. And we drink your blood right now in remembrance of you, knowing by faith that you've cleansed us and made us whole in Jesus' name. You can receive. Hallelujah. Just lift your hands and thank Him right now. Thank you for it. It's done. We're new creatures in Christ. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new by the glory of the Lord. And I speak glory over every person in this place. I thank you that we drink from the living waters today, God. And I thank you for turnaround in Jesus' name. A command turnaround in every life that wants to follow the Lord Jesus Christ right now. Never be the same in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for the glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus. Hold the blood of Jesus against the enemy. Draw the bloodline. We had to do that when we came in this building. Yeah, we're going to receive... Uh, what's that? Hang on a second. Come on up, Mimi. You want to say something? No, I just need some prayer. Oh, Okay. Mamie wants us to pray for her right now. Most of you know Mamie and know her situation. Some of you may not. Mamie's husband passed away uh, suddenly last Sunday, or Saturday, I'm sorry, last Saturday. And uh, so just stretch your hands out toward Mamie. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you are the God of all comfort. You never leave us and you never forsake us. This caught us by surprise. It did not catch you by surprise. And so we know that you've already made a process and, and made a plan for Mamie and her life. But Father, as she goes through this time of transition, as she goes through this time of mourning and uh, letting go and uh, just moving forward in her life, we thank you that you comfort her. God, we make ourselves available for her in any way that you want us to be. 
Bring her before us that we might pray for her, or whatever else you might want us to do. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that uh, your peace is upon her, your strength is with her, and that uh, her future, Father, in you is fulfilled in your goodness. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you, amen. Praise God. Amen. Well, we're going to receive, real quick, an offering before we leave. Every, every month when we have communion, we receive what we call our harvest offering. And what it is, it goes into a fund to help people who have basic needs, such as food and gas, diapers. A portion of it goes uh, into our food bank ministry. Every Thursday we give away. We purchase 15 boxes of food every Thursday, and we give away about 30. They always give us more than what we've paid for to give away. But uh, so a portion of this goes into that to bless people and to help them with their needs. And we've got uh, a Holy Ghost filled group that meets there every Thursday. Joanne Beavers is the leader of that group and some of the folks are here today. And so when people come in, they not only get some natural food, they get some spiritual food. They get prayer. We've seen everything, uh, all kinds of things healed and just good things done. So it's an opportunity for us to reach out. So just lift your hand if you need an offering envelope for that and let's just pray. Lord, we thank you that your word tells us that we are always to remember those that are struggling, those within the body and those without the body. And so, Lord, in Jesus' name, thank you. As we've received of the fullness of what you've done for us at the cross, we thank you, Father, that we can meet others' needs as you allow us to do so. And so thank you for the team, the, the food ministry team and ministry team. Thank you, Father, for the opportunities we have to talk to others. Thank you for those even in our own body, Lord, that might be going through a rough time. And we can just uh, help them and encourage them by uh, helping them move forward uh, financially or with food or whatever it might be. So we thank you for that. And I thank you, Lord. Your word says, he that gives to those that are poor or struggling uh, in poverty in an area or another. Your word says that those that give to the poor, that the Lord will repay them. And bless them. And I thank you for blessing your people, for blessing others in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, as Karen mentioned, we're going to be leaving Wednesday to go back to Branson, Missouri. We go every year to Billy Brim's prayer gathering. I encourage you to uh, look up her website, and you can watch this meeting live over the Internet if you want to. It's Billy Brim, B-I-L-L-Y-E. B-R-I-M is how you spell it. It's not Billy Graham, it's Billy Brim. And uh, it starts, uh, actually, uh, I think Wednesday is when they will start the meeting, Wednesday or Thursday, and it'll go day and night all the way through Sunday. And then Monday they're going to have a big, uh, they always have a big tent meeting out on her property there. <clears throat> and uh, so we're going to be at the meeting. We go every year. We, we just, we go because we know the Lord's connected us with her and we're to be there for that meeting every year. And I like it because uh, a couple of thousand people show up and they're all people that pray. Yeah. They're not just there to spectate, you know, they're not just there to get something, they're there to pray and be part. So it's a different environment and it's a wonderful environment. We've had some, just some wonderful things happen in our lives at that meeting. But pray for us because we'll be ministering in a couple of churches and uh, whatever else the Lord has for us on this trip. And then of course, Charlie Champ will be here Friday. Friday night at 7, Saturday night at 6, and Sunday both services. And he is truly a man of God, a prophet of God, has an anointing. If you know somebody that needs a miracle, needs healing in their life and, or something in their life, bring them to this meeting because God's going to be here and he's going to do some great things. Amen. Let's stand. Lord, we just bless your people. Thank you that as they go, your peace, your power is upon them. As they focus on you over the next several days and they praise you and thank you, God, I thank you for working in their life. Thank you for doing what you need to do in their lives as they praise you. And we do praise you, Lord. We thank you for who you are. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord. Amen.